Today we're going to talk about how to help people from different cultural backgrounds get along well in the workplace, how to integrate and settle into a company and how to contribute to its success. Welcome to Profile 3 TV and today we're joined by Graeme Orr from Intercultural Training Solutions. So Graeme, welcome. Thank you. And thank you for taking time out to chat to us today. Very much appreciated. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I grew up talking like this because I grew up in Yorkshire. And then one goes down south in England to learn how to be a teacher. And one learns that one has to talk properly to get a job in education. Yes. Then you marry a girl from Glen Gormley and you come over to Northern Ireland and have to talk like this. <laughs> but I spent most of my working life working in Japan. Incredible. So from England to Northern Ireland to Japan. And, and how many years in Japan? I was nearly 20 years in Japan. We used to work four years out in Japan, one year back home in Northern Ireland. Oh. Four years out, one years back. So the kids were always being taken out of a school and put in another school and another language. And, uh, so loads of mix, mixing. Yeah, constant change. But of course, I'm sure the impact has been positive because I know there's loads of changing and chopping with friends, but they, they would have grown up in a multicultural environment. Uh, yeah, they language. went to Japanese primary school and were yeah. bilingual and then they went to international middle school with so many different nationalities and they've grown up with a very broad sense of what the world is. Amazing. So your, your, your company and what you do, you help other businesses understand cultures and provide harmony in, in the workplace, is that...? Yeah, I go into a place like, I was chatting to a guy in Ballyclare the other day, he works in the IT section I think, I just said what what's your team like? And he says, oh, you know, most of them here, but there's a couple of French guys, an Indian guy and a Spaniard. Wow. And I said, oh, so, you know, the French guys always want decisions to be kicked upstairs, right? He looked at me and said, well, yeah, how do you know that? Well, French people are trained and educated to deal with hierarchy. That's, that's how their culture is. It's mm -hmm. normal for a French person to want the decision to be made by somebody above them. And the Indians, I asked him, Oh, the Indians, he says, they, they just say yes all the time, but don't mean it. <laughs> yeah. To which I said, well, uh, yes, because that's actually how a lot of countries work, because countries that are not as individualistic as ours, mm -hmm. they, they, they want harmony in personal relationships. And everything from India out to Japan, where I was, human relationships are important. And, and yes doesn't mean I agree. It means I'm on the other end of this conversation. Yes, then. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's so it's going into companies like that and helping them understand how different people work with different values, a different sense of how you solve a problem. Mm -hmm. There's great synergy if you have different approaches rather than just one approach. Because a Spaniard <clears throat> and the French guys and the Indian guys, will, they will see things, they will develop things that folk from here won't because they, they view things differently. If you can get the team to work well together, you gain far more. But without that, you have miscommunication and misunderstanding and... You know, people don't settle in the company and after a year they go home and you have to re bring somebody else in, recruit again, retrain them again and the company just doesn't get anywhere. So I go in to try and provide those sorts of companies with uh, an opportunity for people to talk to each other in a safe environment, understand where each other is coming from, smooth out some of the problems and appreciate the difficulties as an opportunity to grow. Amazing. And we, we take in and have a few Erasmus students come in here to share the oh, culture yeah. with yeah. Uh, our team and vice versa. And you're right, it's, um, we've had po from people from Portugal, from Germany, I can't remember uh, one of the mm. countries now, but you're actually totally right, the, the, the mix of the culture and watching how the team interacts, mm. it is quite in incredible because everyone's different. And then yeah. bringing the other, other cultures. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's always personality. But in general, a Portuguese person coming in will talk to lots and lots of different people all at the same time about lots of different things. Whereas a German guy coming in is quite likely to talk to one person and, and have that conversation very clear. And then, if it's scheduled, move on to a second person. I am um, impressed. <laughs> no. yeah. Was that actually how it works? We've we <laughs> seen a, a big difference. As, well, of course, uh, we've seen a massive difference between the, the two countries. Yeah, and yeah. You, you forget. Even, and uh, I know you mentioned to you, I, I had six years in Egypt and two years in Dubai and three years in England, which I... I, oh, I, I careful in England. <laughs> which I count as a, a, a you know, a cultural experience. Yeah, it's cross-cultural for me coming to Northern Ireland because it's different. It doesn't it, work the same. It is very different, uh, totally different. So um, it, it, even I've had that experience and I forgot back 
home now four years nearly and I even forgot you know how complex it can be but the opportunities to to have the team learn and to integrate and and the the value that other cultures add is, is yeah, incredible. I think the most the important thing to learn is that your own viewpoint is only your own viewpoint it's not right it's not superior it's not the only way to do it yeah. but because we grow up with one set of glasses on we see everything through one set of glasses. Mm. I was chatting to a Romanian girl who works as a scientist in Japan and she's got quite a good read on Japanese culture. She's, she's quite able to see what Japanese culture is like. She was having so many problems because actually she didn't understand that her own cultural glasses were her own cultural glasses. So she was looking at Japanese culture but judging it based on her own culture. And she was getting herself in a real frustrated mess yeah. because she didn't actually understand where she herself was coming from. Yeah, so part of what I do is offer people the chance to examine where their own culture is coming from mm -hmm. because it's about being intercultural. It's understanding how the two different cultures look, look at each other. Yeah. So I was doing a day for uh, Brazilians and Koreans, yeah. let, giving them chance, to, they were living in Dublin, uh, giving them chance to reflect on their year or so in Dublin and you know, what's been encouraging and why and what's been discouraging and why. So I, I give them a reflection seat, sheet and ask them to uh, sit quietly 15 minutes and just review the year about what was... Uh, the Brazilians couldn't sit still. They, they couldn't be quiet. They had to touch their neighbours and chat to them. <laughs> now the Koreans just got their heads down and got on with it. Very, very different cultures. Uh, and they didn't want to talk to each other. Wow. Wow. So amazing, that. And just, just in that little example. Have you seen, so you've been over and back quite a few times now, over all the years, have you seen much change in Ireland? Um, how we are... I think the country? biggest change coming back to Northern Ireland every time is that since the Good Friday Agreement, there are more and more non-local people walking up and down Royal Avenue. Yeah. You walk up and down in the centre of town now. And there's a lot of different languages being spoken, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of different ethnic groups doing all sorts of things, which uh, that cultural diversity brings richness. Mm -hmm. I think it also probably brings confusion yes. because things are being done, said, acted upon with different values and different intentions. And I, I suspect there's quite a lot of local folk who, who don't really know how to react to those situations and increasingly in companies across Northern Ireland. Um, Te teamwork is done with quite a number of different ethnicities in there and uh, I want to be able to help those groups understand each other, work well together because uh, that engenders company success, doesn't it? Totally, and uh, no, I totally agree with your point that things are changing here dramatically because I, I think even when I first came to Belfast, uh, originally from Monaghan, so it's like 100 miles away, but uh, 50 miles. But um, you know, coming to the, the, the Belfast and, and Belfast today is, is, is totally transformed. And companies here now, uh, we're bringing in the foreign direct investment, mm. and companies here are setting up businesses around the world. Yep. And uh, you don't have to be too far away, you can actually be working with international teams. Mm -hmm no matter what, and, and understanding the culture of those teams is, is so, so important, it's uh, incredible. Yeah, there's a number of Japanese companies that have bought companies here. I mean, there's Duobi and Carrick Ferguson Canyon, but a um, Japanese company called Terimo bought a, a land pharmaceutical firm. Uh, you know, who, who would have thought it? Incredible. Yeah. And the opportunities are, are, are stretching for people to be sent abroad for a year or two and you know, if people are going to go abroad for a year or two they need some help before they go otherwise yep. after three months they're going to be having quite a hard time so I'm, I'm happy to go in and sit with people and say when you go abroad you know, this is the country you're going to is going to be like this which is very different from where you are now yeah. and these are the problems you're going to face because you go to that particular country uh, it's very individual yeah. so I provide training to help people in particular situations so if you've got a French French guys and Spaniards and Indians, and I will give training that pick up the particular differences between Northern Ireland and those countries, because the differences are different depending on where people come from. Um, and sometimes it's so broad, Microsoft in Dublin has 71 nationalities. Incredible. So if you have a seminar group of 20 and you have 20 different nationalities, then it's a, a, it's a great challenge, I love it, but you have to sit with an understanding of where all these are people are coming from and how they're 
relate with each other. Yeah, and how, how they learn and interact and work mm. together. Incredible. And I'm thinking of some of the big companies we've here, and they do, as you say, send people abroad for a year or two years, and the last thing you want is actually send some out and then they're coming back um, too, too early. It's and often the, the main person being sent out, the employee from the company, is looked after, but the accompanying family are not. It can be very, very hard for accompanying spouses and kids because they don't have a role, they don't know what to do, and they actually spend more time interacting with local culture at the shops and in schools of course, of course. than, than the, the main employee who ends up working in an international company and yeah. works in English or whatever. Yeah. And they need a lot of support and care. Yes, so there's a, a lot to, to learn, but a lot of opportunity here then as well. For Yes, I mean, I wouldn't have thought there would be so many opportunities in Northern Ireland, but looking around um, the, in, in hospitality and hotels, mm -hmm. Uh, I was chatting to someone from the Merchant Hotel, and she was telling me the different nationalities that work on the staff there. It's um, yeah. Groups like uh, Almac, um, you know, the pharmaceutical and blood products end has got quite an international uh, background. Schrader, Caterpillar, uh, where'd you go? There seem to be more and more groups employing more and more people. And with Brexit, whatever happens, yeah. well, there are likely to be people from wider afield coming to Northern Ireland to do jobs. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to be coming from cultures that we are less familiar with. Of course. Which usually means more diff differences and confusion. Yes, of course. But again, if, if you do get this right, if you do get the, the culture and the fix and get the understanding mm -hmm. in the team, the, the opportunity, the, the win yeah. for the company is yeah. impressive. Yeah. Everyone, everyone's on the same page. It's about <laughs> being willing to learn, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. about being able to sit and with somebody that you've not met before from a country you don't know and say so what do I not know that I need to know yeah. I was at a conference in Prague with a, a lot of different cultures and I sat next to a girl and she was from Panama I'd never met somebody from Panama so I just said so tell me about Panama and she talked and she took for an hour I didn't get a word in I was so enriching because I didn't know yeah. and you just have to ask a question and people are very happy to talk, talk about where they're from yeah, and what they're doing um, it's a great opportunity for us all to learn, isn't it? Yes, and, and, and they grab it with two hands, and often we don't take them when we, when we meet people like this. So actually speaking of this, and now with your 20 years experience in uh -huh. Japan, I'm going to uh -huh. grill yourself in, in all about Japan, because uh, I've never been, but on my list of places I need to see uh -huh. someday. So is Japan, like we see in the movies, it's all small streets and historic and um, lights everywhere, or how, how would you describe Japan for someone who's never been? I lived in Tokyo, which is 30 million people within 30 miles. Wow. Okay. So if you draw a line from Larne through kind of Loch Ness, round the back of Belfast to Bangor, and dump half the population of the UK in that, you have Tokyo. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, and so, of course, it's narrow streets and lots of lights in the electrical district and uh, trains every two minutes with you know, thousands and thousands of people on. And that is what I lived in for many, many years. But I did my Japanese language training up in the north of Japan, wow. where it starts to snow in November. And you get a foot of snow overnight, most nights, for five months, and the temperature's never above zero until April, which is a very different. Yeah. Um, head down south in Japan, because it's a very long, thin country, yeah. and you don't get snow and you get almost tropical beaches. Wow. Um, Japan is very busy because the Japanese live on 3% of their land area. Most of the land in Japan is mountainous. Uh, because of volcanoes, it pushes the mountains very strongly up, so you can't build on it. So the reason that Japan is as crowded as it is, is because they live on the few flat bits. So where there is a plain, there's an awful lot of people. Yeah. So you build houses and you have rice, because rice produces more crop per area than any other crop. Wow. Uh, so when you are with Japanese in a city, it's very busy. Once you step out of the city, there's nobody and there's just mountains and, and hot springs. Okay. Oh. Incredible. And, and um, the, the, the accommodation, the rooms, hotel rooms are all, again, right? Things are pretty small. I mean, small. we grew up as a family of four in a, in a flat that was 500-ish uh, square feet. What, 50 square metres, is it? Wow, well, OK. So. And, you know, the family next door had three children, we only had two. That's normal yeah. uh, for, for Tokyo. Wow. Uh, and the, the walls are very thin. Very good. Because <laughs> they are literally made out of paper. They're a wooden frame with paper covering and you slide them in and out when you go from room to room. That, that is how it, how it is. Uh, and everybody gets on with it and that's normal life. And even with the neighbours, it's, it's still 
It's not traditional. In, we were in an apartment block for most of our time, and the, the walls are reasonably fl reasonably thick. But you walk in and say, "We're in your own house." I'd come home from work at you know whatever time that was, absolutely drained because you know I'd been working in Japanese all day. Yeah. Crawl into the house, brain dead, and you know my two little kids wanted to play, and yeah. it's like, no, yeah. uh, daddy's tired. He goes in the other room, yeah. but yeah, that's what yeah, you're all living on top <laughs> of each other. Oh, that's it. And work was life is all in Japan and uh, Japanese. Sorry, it's not the language. So I went to Japanese language school uh, and learned Japanese. So I worked with Japanese staff, uh, employing staff or training staff uh, or leadership or group meetings, decision making, all in Japanese. So. It, Linguistic, it takes 10 years to get a reasonable amount of Japanese. Wow. But it takes another 10 years to understand how to use it culturally appropriately. So if I'm sitting in a meeting with five or six Japanese men talking about deciding something, you know, and I make a co I suggest something, they would not reply directly to me commenting on what I've just said. They would say something else, obliquely. And then the next guy would say something Again, not connected to that. So initially, you just think, well, what are we doing here? But they wouldn't ever come straight back at you because that would be quite rude, especially for me as a leader. They wouldn't be able, in that context, to confront me, even, even gently, about an issue. They would, they would say something else. My job is to know what they think, not what they say. What? So I've met with each person before the meeting to chat things over and understand where everybody's at. And then we all get together and we all say all that we all say in a very harmonious and nice fashion. But I know what everybody actually thinks. So they've all had chance to speak. They've all felt heard. And then we make the decision that I wanted to make before we started, which they all sign up to. And they will all follow. But it's a very different way of making decisions. So the average person who's not used to working in that environment, which is very subtle, very indirect, very person-centered, mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's choreographed. If you know what's happening, you can look at it and see, there's a phrase called reading the air. You can see what's going on, but it's not in the words. It's in what's not said and the way it's not said. And you have to understand what someone is not saying and how they're not saying it. So I reply to that, not by what I say, but what I don't say. Uh, it just takes. Yeah, it just, yeah, it's not. It's not clear to somebody else who has no idea. First, when I was in, first in Japan, I went to get a job uh, for an English language school, and when I was there, the national immigration law changed, so you didn't have to leave the country to get a visa. Mm -hmm. So I went with my business manager of the language school to uh, the immigration local immigration centre, but he'd written my contract, which stated on things on two pages. When we got to the immigration office, I realised, you know, we were sitting on uh, black leather sofas drinking green tea, as you do. Yeah. He only presented the top page, the first page of the contract, to the immigration officer. Uh -huh. So I, I knew that my contract that I'd signed didn't fulfil immigration requirements to get a visa. But he'd, set, he'd put forward the first page and not the second. Mm -hmm. And there was I, a naive 23-year-old Westerner who had the courage and naivety to say, excuse me, that's a lie. I embarrassed the guy immensely in front of the immigration officer and we left very quickly. I didn't get the job. But I didn't realise how business was being done. Gotcha. Because the business manager knew how to do business with the immigration officer and the immigration officer knew how to do business with him. Yes. They both knew exactly what was, what was going on. on. They were both actually okay with it, but form has to be fulfilled. Yeah. And I just didn't understand the deeper, deeper, deeper levels. And even after 20 years, there are still cultural levels that I don't get because I'm not native-born Japanese. It's incredible. And then, as you say, that's, that's how business is lost because we don't understand the, What's going the on? culture and uh, misread things and, mm. and think, we're, think we're helping, but actually, in reality, we're not. So mm. incredible. So again, so uh, Japanese people work very long hours. They work as long as the boss works. You can't go home if the boss is in the building, because that's disrespectful. Wow. So if the boss is there till 10 o'clock, you, you can't go home. Uh, you have to carry on working. Uh, and so there, there's little social life, but we judge it by our own values. We think that coming home at 5.30 and having time with your family or mm -hmm. going out with your mates, is that, is that is how it should be. Mm -hmm. 
but there are no shoulds. Um, the Japanese will go out with their workmates after work, and at, at work they're very controlled. They say the right things to the right people. Yeah. You, you say all the things you need to say to your boss in the way you should say it, and you look after those below you all the time. Afterwards, when you go for a drink, once you've had a glass of uh, pint of beer or something, mm. you're actually allowed to say anything you like. And they let off steam, and they talk, and they say things that, yeah, you wouldn't ever say in a work situation. You're still kind of almost at work, yeah. but it's allowed. Wow. It's, it's a situation where you can say what you like. Yeah. And because you've had a drink, it's all forgotten the following day. Amazing. So respect is very important. And Respect's and very important. You know, when, when you give someone a business card yeah. with two hands, and you take it with two hands, mm -hmm. and you put it on the desk and make sure that you look at it lots of times, what's happening? You're finding out who the guy is, what company they're from, uh, probably how old they are, what their position is, because before you even begin to speak in Japanese, you have to know how much respect to show this person. Wow. The verbs, the nouns, the endings, the way you phrase it. If this person is, is older than me and, and senior in many ways, I've got to change my language to show that respect, uh, which wouldn't be the same if he was younger than me or less experienced. So a business card is the initial, with the bow, is the initial offering of how do, how do we relate here? So I can no throw it away because all these little little things. But actually, in a, again, back to it, in a business meeting, uh, if a Japanese uh, customer or partner was coming over, or vice versa, we're going over there. You get a few of these wrong. It's not going to leave. I mean, if Japanese gives you a business card, and you go, yeah, Ta, thanks very much for giving me a book. You have just you've just shown incredible disrespect. Yeah, they um, wouldn't they would not be happy with. No. And, and rightly so. We need to learn if we're doing business with people. We need to learn a little bit about their culture to understand the, the small little things I guess. Yeah, when, when you greet people, I often get people to stand up in a training session. Mm. Uh, I get ten of them to stand up. They don't know what's coming. Mm. And so to the first one I say, I shake hands. Mm -hmm. And the second one I shake hands and they're quite okay with that. The next two, I walk up to them and give them a hug. And I've got one or two people start thinking, what's going on? <laughs> the next two, I kiss on the cheek. Uh, and that, that starts to get people a bit more a bit more worried. Um, uh, the, the next two, I will give a Japanese formal bow to. Wow. And they have absolutely no idea. They just stand there feeling really, really awkward. Uh, and then the last two, I would do something like uh, Salam Alaikum mm -hmm. and greet them in Arabic. Mm -hmm. And they just, yeah, what's happening? Well, I mean, when you shake someone's hand, you're mm -hmm. saying we're about equal. Yeah. We're not getting intimate here. Yeah. We're about equal. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. we live in this Northern European, we're all equal. I don't care who you are, where you're from, we're all equal. Yeah. Um, when you give someone a, a hug or a bit more touchy feely, um, you know that would be more common in Southern Europe, yeah. South America. Uh -huh. You're looking for friendship much faster. People will open up much, much more quickly in those sorts of cultures. Oh, yeah. But in Japan, what are you doing? Uh, I mean, Thai, Thailand would be the same. Korea would be the same. Um, you're creating distance, not intimacy. Wow. You're saying, I respect you. I am below you. I'm here to serve you. But for most folk from our cultural background, that's very foreign. That's not what you think you're doing in a greeting. No, no. But in, in, in Asian cultures, it's all about respect. And interpersonal communication is showing the appropriate amount of respect. So when I meet someone in Japanese, you know, I have to bow. I mean, I bow on the phone. If you have to take a Japanese phone call, hi, 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 hi. I mean, you can't not bow um, because you need to show respect. It's incredible. So what, what else uh, should we consider when we're interacting with Japan or other cultures? Is there, so we've, we've, the respect element is very important. The, I guess the, the way people work out there is slightly different as well. I think from, for most of, as we talked earlier about India out to Japan, mm -hmm. um, it's not about the individual. It's about the group. Yes. Um, J Japanese, as many, many cultures are, it's all about, I belong to this group, I get my identity and my status from the group and I wouldn't do anything to create shame on myself or yeah. the group, it's all about the group. Uh, we come from a very individualistic culture which is basically, I can express myself any way I like and if you don't like it that's your problem. Yeah. Uh, and when those two clash, the very individualistic cultures against what are called collectivist cultures, uh, you tend to get an awful lot of misunderstandings. Um, so that's something I would take a group through. And then the second is an understanding of, of power, 
for, for us in a, a Western, well, Northern European and mm. countries derived from that culture, we, we think everything should be fairly flat. You know, everybody should have equal access to all the power. Um, an awful lot of the world, certainly Asia and, and, and Africa, um, they just accept that different people have different amounts of power. And there's going to be people that have got more power than you. That's how life is. Get on with it. And that they, they both accept it and they work with it. But that's why they show respect. Yes. And that's why they keep within particular groups. And those two often work together. Um, India out onto Japan, Middle East would be the same. Um, you know, people understand the nature of power in a group setting. So if I'm in a group with 10 Japanese, uh, no point in asking a question like, so anybody got any ideas? Because you're not going to get an answer. They will all sit there in total silence because they all know who the oldest person in the group is. And they will not give an opinion that's different from the oldest person in the group. So they're not going to speak. They're not going to say anything until the oldest person in the group has shown their hand and then they will agree, even if that's not their opinion, because that's how the group functions. The problem is that somebody who doesn't understand that thinks the group's not creative or bored or not interested. Or, no, 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 they're just following their own cultural rules that we can't see. And so we misinterpret silence. And that can cause quite a lot of problem at business meetings because you look at people and you don't know why they're not saying anything. You're, but there's uh, a reason they're not yeah. saying something. Yeah, and you're thinking to yourself, have I done something wrong or said something wrong? or? Is this meeting not going well yeah. at all? Yeah. But yet it could be yeah. going just as you need it. So yeah. back to understanding the cultures. You have to give people the right to speak. And in the Japanese setting, not just Japan, most Asian settings, you have to give people a personal right to speak. They, they won't put their hands up and volunteer in a group setting because the group is hierarchical. But if you say, at Makiko, a Japanese person, you know, have you got something you'd like to share? you're much more likely to get a response. But if I look at a group, I can see on their faces who wants to respond. But a person who's not used to that can't. Um, Japanese don't like eye contact. They find that quite threatening. Yeah, so I've done some training in public speaking. It's very hard to get Japanese to look at you when they speak because that's a sign of disrespect. Uh, and so in a group situation, if you look around the room, the people who are looking at you are usually the ones who want to contribute. And those that aren't looking at you are quite happy to sit there and not contribute. Mm -hmm. So normally in a group situation, I can read the air, as they say, and know who wants to come in. Mm -hmm. But it's not verbal. It's all, almost entirely indirect communication, mm -hmm. which is very hard for people to read because we live in a fairly direct culture mm -hmm. that says what it needs to say, the way it needs to say, and isn't used to reading silence and uh, subtle signs of, you know, yeah. people who want to be involved in the conversation. Yes, we missed that one. So again, we're, we're learning a lot here today, which is brilliant, so thank you very much for that. Yeah. I'm thinking of companies here locally, um, do you think that, especially people who haven't been abroad, and of course we're going to hold this, but lived abroad, yeah. uh, do you think managers or management level here understand cultural complexity in their teams? I think they have. They probably have problems that they don't realise they have. I was chatting to a guy at a business meeting last week and I told him what I did and I worked with people helping people from different cultural backgrounds get on in the workplace and he said, oh well, um, in my previous company we had uh, quite a few people from quite a few different places and we had an open company where anybody could say anything and we never had any problems. Now, I didn't try to defend the issue, I just said I'm really glad that your company didn't have any problems. Mm -hmm. There were probably problems, but no one was talking about the problems. Mm -hmm. Because from his point of view, because no one was saying we had a problem, he thought there were no problems. Mm -hmm. But anybody from an Asian background in that context, they wouldn't actually say they had a problem. You know, He felt that because the company was open and anybody could say anything, but for most Asian folk, that's not a situation that helps them to put their hand up and say, actually, I have a problem. So I suspect they actually did have problems, but didn't realise they had problems. Um, leadership is a tricky thing. Mm -hmm. How do you motivate people? Mm. You know, if you want to motivate people by praising them, I think that works in an American setting. You wouldn't work in Japan. I, uh, I learned the chromatic harmonica under a Japanese 
professional uh, harmonica player. And we were in a group of 12, mm -hmm. uh, I was the only foreigner, and he would listen to us all play. He would never put, praise anybody publicly, because to praise one person out of the group shames all the others. Wow. You'd destroy the group. So he would say, oh, Graham's got Graham's sound, and Yamaguchi sound's got Yamaguchi sound's sound. But you would never rank those. He would never say anybody is better than anybody else, although, of course, some were much better than others, yeah. because that would harm the, the harmony of the group. Leadership is a very tricky thing. Yeah. Um, if you want to motivate somebody by offering them a reward for performance, mm -hmm. that sets some people apart from others. Now, that works in some cultures. But it creates a great disharmony and a sense of shame that I've, I've not performed as well as everybody else mm -hmm. in, in other cultures. And leadership is about understanding people and helping them to flower and blossom in, in, in their careers. You have mm -hmm. to know people very well, and, and people are very different. Yes. Um, in Japan, leadership is very hierarchical, top-down. You do what your boss says, you don't question it. Um, you, you nod to whatever is required and you get on with it. Mm. Someone from a very flat country and an individualistic country walking into that would find it very, very hard. I had a friend here who uh, has a boss who I found out wasn't, wasn't from here. She, uh, she sent me a text. that uh, cultural question, she said. I, I went to London for induction when I met the PR team of the company uh, and the head of PR isn't unfriendly but she's very abrupt. Uh, I booked a meeting to meet the team face to face and she started by saying something like what's, what's the point of this meeting and we all introduced ourselves and when we finished she said something like okay I, I think that's everything and just close the meeting uh, and then today when she actually texted me she said we had a phone call it's a regular one from a number of different countries uh, and near the end I started to ask a few questions about uh, newsletters and before I even started to reply uh, this this boss said, excuse me, uh, uh, do you mind if I leave the call because the newsletters aren't relevant to me and somebody else wants to talk to me, I'm going now. And she, she just said to me, um, you know, where on earth do you think she's from? So I, I, I think, and I, I, I had two choices, and um, I got the country next door because that person wasn't being rude, although it was felt like it was being rude, the way it was felt the way. like it yeah. was impersonal, yeah. it felt abrupt and you don't matter and you don't... But someone was just living out from their own cultural values. Wow. And, and I was able to help her understand that you know, this person wasn't actually being rude. rude. Yeah, but so when you explain that to me and tell me that story, it sounds like, oh my word, this person's very tough and you yeah. would not want to work in that company at all. Yeah. But, but she's working in the UK, no, I think it was a woman, uh, was working in the UK. <laughs> and so she brings her cultural values to the UK and treats other people like she's always treated people. Yeah. You don't expect anything different, but she doesn't understand how that is understood Perceived. by people who, um, who are not used to it. Yes. Um, and, and perception is, it's both have to understand the other. Yeah, um, very important. And you can see that that's a story that someone's reached out to you, I'd say the company, and then that's, well, I guess, company's reputation. That it uh, can permeate around, uh, you know, Everywhere people get a perception that the company is either very good to work for or very bad if they're not yeah. investing in the culture. It only takes a comp uh, somebody to, to go onto a review site and yeah. say the management and this company doesn't understand people and you cause yourself negative, negative reviews when actually yeah. it was a culture to cultural, intercultural issue. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. That's so, a perfect example of the risk, I guess, of uh, not integrating the workforce uh, correctly and no matter what we don't have the skills I'm thinking here in Northern Ireland again we don't have all the skills we need to bring people in look at our health service uh, mm -hmm. and we have some amazing doctors and nurses in from all over the world because we don't have the skills here but again they they all yeah, need to they interact very differently I was chatting to a Nigerian woman who, who works in, in the Royal yeah. and she said yeah um, doctors and nurses are a very interesting thing country by country how many doctors you have per how many nurses you have is very different and almost accurately reflects how power is distributed in those particular countries. Wow. Um, and uh, you know, in Nigeria, doctors are way up there. Um, and you know, again, you have a, a hierarchical structure, uh, whereas here it's, it's a wee bit flatter. Uh, incredible. So what advice would you give to a company that has employees 
um, in the house from different cultures? Is there things that they should be doing or thinking of? I think understand that they're different, but not wrong. That they've got such a... They come with lots of presents in their baggage. Because mm -hmm. we often talk about cultural baggage. It has a slightly negative connotation. Yeah, baggage, yeah. Um, but the baggage is full of presents that they bring to your company, they'll bring new insights, new yeah. understandings, fresh ways of looking at things, yeah. particularly in um, relationships. Most of it comes down to relationships, how you relate to people. Um, there's some things about time and space, how we use time and space is very culturally related, oh. but most of the cultural issues are interpersonal relations uh, and they bring a richness if you can get through the confusion. So. Mm -hmm. Give your employees some orientation. Uh, give them some freedom to settle in. And, and I, I know some companies in Northern Ireland who provide three months free rent to those moving in and stock their fridges full of food. Amazing. I mean, it's just to say you're in a new place. Yeah. Welcome. It, it's very hard to settle in. Um, I was chatting to an American woman at a meeting the other week. Uh, she's lived in Northern Ireland a long time. I said, how was it when you first came here? And she just said, everything is so encoded here. That was the, her phrase. Uh, there's, there's proxies for religion. Of course there are. You know what they are when you've been here a while. It took me a while to figure that one out. Yeah. Um, you know, where your kids play tennis is important. And she's begun to understand the clues <laughs> that actually when you've grown up here, of course you take for, for granted. Yeah. Because we avoid using certain words, words and issues, yeah. but we refer to them and anybody else understands what that is. But for a foreigner coming in here, yeah. They have absolutely no <laughs> understanding what anybody is talking about yeah. um, because they're actually blind to the cultural clues. So give people some uh, orientation. Help, help them to understand not just this culture, but their own culture. Because if they don't understand where they're coming from, and most people, we don't usually understand where we're coming from until we go somewhere else and meet a lot of people that are not where we're coming from. Exactly. I'm not even thinking of people from here who are going abroad as well to, to live. Yeah. So when you went to Egypt, did you get any training before you went? Any help to understand what is a, an African uh, Islamic, Egyptian in this case, culture going to be like for you? No, no. Um, and even, so I was lucky probably two years in Dubai before that, but I didn't get out and go to Dubai either. So, <laughs> no, no. Um, so it, and actually that you'd think they, were like, they, they would be the same, but uh, there was such differences between the two countries. Um, yes. yes. And Dubai, there was loads of Cultures yeah. in Dubai. Yes, Dubai is so international, yeah. But going to Egypt and worked and lived in Cairo, mm -hmm. um, it was really, really, really Egyptian. So yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, didn't have as much influence. But it was, it was an amazing, amazing experience. And the, and the yes, uh, you're right. Everyone says yes uh, to everything. So you think for a couple of months that you're on a, uh, a flyer, but then you realise yeah, no one's doing that. It's just <laughs> yes. And then uh, like the back to the hierarchy of jobs and positioning, and um, in a in a job, people valued actually title and promotion more than they did the maybe the monetary rewards, yep. which is really interesting. So title was so yep. so important, and the reason for that is that your title was on your your job title was yep. on your national ID. Yep. And um, that was basically uh, your social class, and it was so so important to the culture. Yeah. Amazing, but that's only like, no. But st status is important for all of us. Yes, and we get that status in different ways. So in an individualistic culture, people tend to get status by accomplishment. What have I achieved? Mm -hmm. You know, did I get a first at university? Mm -hmm. Whereas in many cultures, status is um, ascribed to you. So it's more important in Japan which university you went to, not, not actually what result you got, mm -hmm. because it's your connection with that group. You know, if you're a graduate of Tokyo University, mm -hmm. oh, you're away. It doesn't really matter what grade you got. Mm -hmm. uh, so in many cultures, yes, the job you do, the, the place you live, the family you belong to, are all ways of getting status and belonging. And those in individualistic cultures often think that's slightly unfair. Mm, it's just a different way of doing the same mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I worked alongside colleagues from 30-something countries in Japan. And so we were all ready for the experience of everything's going to begin differently. And then you find that you're working alongside Germans and Koreans 
and you get tripped up by their cultural habits yeah. because you are almost over prepared for it's going to be hard in Japan because you're going to get cut shot, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I found I found often the colleagues I worked with more exasperating, and they no doubt felt equally <laughs> exasperated with me <laughs> than the Japanese because I was less prepared to to work as part of a, a team yeah. where you know. We had a guy from Brazil, and yet he just did things differently. Yeah, incredible, amazing. So, and, but yet still, it's uh, an amazing experience, and you meet amazing people, and um, it, it uh, the, the outcome of bringing the cultures together is many times over just having one culture work together without a doubt. And, and yes. And what I've seen in my experience, and I, I guess from what you've seen as well, and even when we see the investment and all the companies coming in here, mm. and companies from Northern Ireland. Going, going abroad as well, which is really, really good to see. So lo long may it, uh, long may it continue. Yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking of um, back to your service that you offer, and with all this opportunity to integrate in workplaces. If someone's watching this and wants to reach out or needs some help, some advice in bringing the the, the team that they have together closer, or looking at bringing in uh, international talent. Uh, in here or thinking of going to any other country around the world um, you, you'd be able to uh, help them out and give yes, them some so advice? All, all, all the above. Um, Brilliant. It's about finding a bespoke answer to people's questions mm -hmm. and I don't always have the answers but I can often go somewhere else and find some answers yes. because that's an opportunity for me to learn okay. or I can talk to somebody if someone knows more about a field than me and um, that's why I have a few connections here and there. Of course. But generally speaking, people need help. And it's yeah. all about trying to find the particular help that they need. There's no, you can't do a one size fits all package. The, the world's cultures and peoples are too complicated <laughs> and intertwined to think, here is something I can do it every time. You, know? um, you can help people to understand what, what does culture consist of, its values, how people find identity, how they shape their lives. That, that's common. But once you get into particular cultures like Finland or Germany or Brazil or Taiwan, then you have to be quite specific about the issues that that culture has. And so it's much more individually, and it requires me to do quite a lot of hard work to understand where people are coming from, of course. Uh, uh, because I want to help real people in real situations who have real problems. It, it starts with that end. So I'm happy to give orientation to people coming here, or to Ireland, to people going abroad, yeah. uh, and to be particularly to get multinational teams together yes. and help them to understand each other in that particular each other setting. Incredible. Brilliant. So if anyone wants to reach out, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Uh, Interculturaltrainingsolutions.co.uk is the, probably the place to start, or find me on LinkedIn uh, or YouTube. Excellent, and we'll have the link to your uh, website underneath this video. Thank you. And uh, really appreciate you coming in and uh, educating me about Japan. I'll no doubt be talking to you again about that. <laughs> it's on the list to see how we uh, go and uh, visit it. But um, really, really interesting to talk about uh, cultural uh, integration and the opportunities um, that are all around us. And uh, I'm sure it'll be of interest to a lot of people who are watching the video. So thank you again for your time. Thanks, Kim. Excellent. And thank you for watching today's video. Very, very interesting. So please do reach out to Graham if you need any advice or help. And um, this is Kieran from Profile Three. So we're your content marketing agency, and we're coming from the Innovation Factory here in the Springfield Road in Belfast. Don't forget to join us tomorrow for our next video. Thank you again.